The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this iChemist Safety Center webinar on the next safety law. In this issue, I have analyzed accidents related to intermediate bulk containers known as IBCs. My name is Susanna Genes, and I am deputy to the director of the iChemist Safety Center. And the purpose of this webinar is to, uh, to give you some overview about different topics. This is the 17th issue of the safety law. If you haven't been here before, then uh, please feel free to visit our website at uh, www.icami.org. And then from there, you can navigate uh, to Safety Center. And under that, you will find a lot of publications and one of them is uh, titled Safety Law. Uh, these safety laws <clears throat> are published every uh, three months. Uh, and they can use they can be used as training materials for your peers or just uh, refreshing knowledge about different topics as well as uh, they are coming in different forms such as a pdf document in the beginning uh, as they are published and uh, they come both in english and spanish languages and then uh, there is a, a podcast version of the safety law and finally, there is this uh, short uh, webinar uh, series. So, as I mentioned earlier, this is the 17th issue of the safety law. Why is it interesting to, uh, to talk about intermediate bulk containers? I will refer to them as IBCs. Now, it's interesting because they have a wide range of use. So, for example, you can see uh, the demonstration of IBCs uh, on this uh, picture on the right hand side. And, and these are the typical containers that you can see everywhere from, from different industrial sites uh, to uh, waste depots or, or waste uh, uh, process depots, uh, everyday use uh, for water or rainwater collection or there is a, a supply for of raw materials, or there is a, an opportunity to storage uh, of finished or either intermediate products, even waste, as I mentioned earlier. So there is really, really a wide range and flexibility using these containers. However, they are not coming uh, without any limitations. What do I mean by that? I mean that the IBCs are susceptible to, to different uh, impacts. For example, after prolonged exposure to UV light or cold weather conditions. So those are the aspects that uh, are interesting. And whenever you see IBCs outside uh, an area um, which is not covered by roof, by anything, uh, and they are not kept in the shade, they are prone to to degrade uh, earlier. So premature aging is really uh, an aspect for IBCs. They don't hold up well against internal overpressure and they can explode if their contents expand, despite the fact that they are framed in uh, something like a, a metal uh, frame, as you can see on the picture as well. But don't be misled because uh, they are quite vulnerable uh, containers. And, and that's why we have to be really careful using uh, IBCs. But I will go through the case studies, which I always do, that I brought uh, two case studies demonstrating the subject. And then you will see why is it interesting to talk about IBCs. Now, if you have your own personal experience or questions, ideas, or comments related to IBCs, I really, really highly encourage you to put your ideas and comments in the questions box. Feel free to use it uh, as you wish. And then we can discuss in the end of the presentation. So as I mentioned earlier, these are really convenient uh, storage uh, 
materials and and storage uh, containers because they can they are uh, not heavy and they can um, be moved quickly and easily with just a pallet uh, truck or a forklift which in itself uh, poses some some risks as you may know about a uh, forklift and and how to handle forklift forklifts and what are the typical incidents that are related to these uh, containers there could be explosions or could be toxic material release as a result of storage of incompatible substances. We will see one of those examples, but I'm sure that you have come across that uh, potential scenario in your experience. I would be really happy to hear that from you. Or, of course, during transport or repackaging. We will see again another example of that. Uh, during transport, mainly because of uh, uh, packing them on a truck or uh, otherwise uh, there are accidents related to a uh, forklift. And I'm, I'm sure that you have seen some of uh, some videos on that uh, subject as well. So more on the characteristics of uh, IBC, some of them I already mentioned, so that they are uh, susceptible to piercing or bursting even uh, can result in damage to their drain valves, so that uh, actually we need to pay more attention to. And yes, they are not so uh, protected against internal overpressure and can explode. I will, I will show you an example. And when aging, they are vulnerable to prolonged exposure to, to the sun and cold weather conditions as well. Now, the first case that I brought to you today occurred on the 5th of January in 2011. And it's not a secret, this is a Chemipack uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and then you will see that um, you, can, you can see the report uh, by the Chemical Safety Board by the Dutch government. Uh, they published a, a very good report, a very good analysis of this particular case, it's Chemipack. So a fire broke out in a chemical packaging company that is located in an industrial area while employees were working on a pump. Flammable, toxic, corrosive substances as well as uh, more than 400,000 liters of substances classified as carcinogenic, solvents, metal powders, chlorinated sulfur containing substances were stored in the warehouse building. Now they were working outside the, the warehouse building uh, where the, the fire started while resin was being pumped from one IBC into another. And the fire grew rapidly and caused a large number of IBCs to explode. Approximately, as you can see here, uh, around 250 IBCs were on the property that afternoon. So quite a large number of these containers. The fire rose up to 40 meter high and spread to an adjacent warehouse and nobody was uh, luckily injured in the accident. But you, you can see the magnitude of such an accident that can be caused by these uh, one cubic meter containers. I mean, you won't expect that uh, such an impact can be, uh, can be caused by any of the damage uh, on these IBCs. But then I would like to highlight the uh, aspect of domino effects because this is highly significant. When you have approximately like 200 or hundreds of IBCs on place and then one uh, catch, catches fire and then that fire can easily reach uh, the remaining of the IBCs around. And this actually happened also in a, a waste um, a waste uh, facility, uh, approximately, I don't know how many, but approximately hundreds of IBC tanks were involved in the fire. The difficulty of that is from the point of view when you come as an emergency responder, that you don't know what you are facing because uh, either of these uh, containers can contain different materials and even, even uh, they can contain uh, different mixtures for example, when there is a site and they just pour uh, different materials, hazardous materials in such containers, and they are kept either on the sun or, but most probably on, on, on the sun or on, on outside uh, area, 
So uh, they are prone to the sunlight, they are prone to all the extreme weather event uh, conditions. But most importantly, when there is a fire, uh, that can be followed by any more um, toxic release, which firefighters have no idea what it is because they don't know what was stored in these IBCs. So labeling uh, may be uh, lacking or maybe misleading or it's not appropriate or it's really difficult when it comes to waste, as we all know. Now, what are the key findings? Some of the key findings from this particular uh, case is that first and foremost, we can see some of the violations uh, occurred in this particular event. The initial findings of the investigation indicated that the operators may not have complied with required operating conditions. For example, pumping liquids from one container into another one was not even permitted by the company. As you remember that in the beginning, I told you that uh, what are the typical incidents that uh, IBCs are uh, mostly involved and, and some of them is this, that incompatible uh, uh, substances or during uh, repackaging. Now repackaging or transporting or uh, pumping liquids from one, another, one to another was not permitted. But it was completed many, many times before the incident and quoting without experiencing any problems. Now, this aspect we have seen in many uh, high visibility incidents in the past as well, that we have done this before many, many times, nothing happened, no problem whatsoever. Just as an example from 100 years ago, when there was the BASF uh, OPAO disaster where ammonium nitrate uh, fertilizers were caking and then uh, they uh, tried to ease the, and, and release the caking uh, using dynamite. And hundreds of thousands of times it was not a problem because we have done this before. But there was one change and then the whole thing exploded. Now, I'm just referring to it because this uh, is a very dangerous uh, sentence to say that we have done this before uh, without experiencing any problems. The fact was that it was uh, against the operating uh, rules and that was that was the first uh, issue. Now what else? On that particular day, it was on the 5th of January as you remember, due to cold temperature, the, uh, the top temperature uh, doesn't uh, didn't reach even 3 or 4 degrees Celsius. The pump's exhaust silencer began to freeze up, causing the resin to stop flowing out of the pump while they were pumping the liquid from one container to another. So it was freezing. After consulting with the supervisor, an employee thought the exhaust silencer with a gas burner. Apparently, this method had been used before several times again despite the use of a gas burner being against the company's rules. So this was the second violation with the knowledge of the uh, supervisor as well. Now, xylene, which is a highly flammable substance, was kept under the pump because it was used to clean the pump. When the employee started heating up the middle of the pump using the gas burner, the xylene caught fire. Now that was the, the direct cause of the fire. Inspections conducted by government agencies between 2001 and 2010. Now, remember, this accident occurred on, in uh, 2011. So over 10 years, government uh, agencies inspected the site. They revealed multiple violations, such as inadequate safety culture, automatic fire suppression extinguishing system ill-suited to the risks involved, and toxic chemicals stored alongside one another without any compatibility analysis being done. Now, I would also question uh, the effectiveness and the follow-up of those investigation and inspections, because being have, I was I was a, a Seveso site uh, inspector earlier in my career, and that is also uh, a high responsibility from the from the government agencies and the regulators and authorities because when they reveal something and there is no follow up then you might question the effectiveness and the influence of those uh, findings and the inspection itself so 
in my case, I've come across one uh, particular warehouse where they didn't uh, have appropriate safety uh, material data sheets, and therefore uh, they um, classified those substances in different categories, and they were not the highest uh, categories they should have been classified, and therefore uh, all the the classification and the notification of the whole warehouse was wrong. For example, um, they took one of the pages, the 15 pages of the safety data sheet as it was in the cover uh, front page, said that it was just um, corrosive or harmful. Meanwhile, the whole mixture based on the components, it uh, was uh, supposed to be uh, toxic or even uh, highly toxic. So in that case where your risks are not identified and analyzed correctly because of the original data is taken uh, wrongly, we actually had the opportunity and the enforcement methods to close the site until they fixed it. And it was not even such a range of violations like in this case. So this is also an aspect not only the operator, it's also the regulator. And, and there are other uh, past uh, cases where we have seen this. Now, the second one is about, it, it occurred in a manufacturing plant, whereby an IBC containing nitric acid exploded at the potassium nitrate production unit of a plant, which manufactured nitrogen substances and fertilizers. Acid vapor spread through the workshop, prompting evacuation of 30 workers. Now, seven workers got sick from inhaling the vapors and they were taken to hospital to examine. The accident occurred whilst a polyethylene IBC was being filled with nitric acid. And then the IBC swelled. A worker unscrewed its cap and then the IBC returned to its original shape but then it exploded when the worker moved it to the production workshop. And what are the key findings in this case is that this particular one was not designed to void acids and contained residual amounts of hydrogen peroxide as well. The IBC that should have been used and which was correctly labeled was left in the storage area for some reason. The reaction between the residual water and the acid produced a gas that increased the pressure inside the IBC, which ultimately led to uh, explosion of the IBC. So these are uh, two prime examples, but there are many, many, many others and quite similar to these two um, that you can find about IBCs. And you might not even imagine, maybe, that they can cause such, magnific mag uh, such a big accident and uh, such big impacts. And so that's why it's interesting and important to, to take them on board and talk about them. And this is the part where I am going to talk about, okay, but what can you do? What is the, what is the good um, practice? about IBCs and how you can avoid such uh, future incidents. So for example, if we take a look at uh, what can I do as a manager, and apologies because it is quite worthy, I know, uh, but let me just uh, guide you through uh, the essence of these. I didn't want to skip or, or miss uh, the information that I, I took in the end uh, provided in the, uh, the safety law because they hold very, very important information. And so, for example, written procedures, written operating procedures are always, always uh, a really good practice. How to load, how to distribute, and what are the conditions of storage uh, or on-site transfer of substances in IVCs. So, for example, related to the first case, whether it is allowed or not, whether uh, you can transfer them, or what is the, the way or mean of uh, transfer of these IBCs, uh, whether you are allowed to, uh, to pump liquid from one to another, and also the regular checks on IBCs. Just walk around, just check how they look like, and then 
make sure that the risks inherent to the storage of IBCs, either they are full, empty, or in use, are identified. The organization and conditions of storage are really, really important. Um, either you want to pile them into individual stacks or division of, of risks. Just remember uh, the picture in the beginning, uh, what I showed you about uh, storing and piling up IBCs within a covered or uh, uh, inside warehouse. Firefighting resources should be available and be effective to limit the extent and spread of fire in case of any emergencies. When select IBCs for the use of the, of the company, they should be suited to specific conditions of use and the particular substances that will be used. Many incidents are results of inadequate ergonomics and especially when we talk about transfer of the substances directly from IBCs or the lack of sufficient space to safely maneuver pallet jacks or forklifts. Special attention should be made uh, to these ergonomics and addressed uh, uh, them. Make sure the training programs are involving the characteristics of IBCs and highlight their susceptibility to physical, chemical impacts together with their storage and use in a safe way. So just in general, just talk about, teach about and train about what is, what is important to know about IBCs, what are the characteristics, what they can, uh, uh, what could be the impact if they, they uh, are involved in an accident. As a process engineer or supervisor, make sure that follow company rules and operating procedures to protect workers. We saw in the first uh, case study that even the supervisor thought it was a, a, a safe practice to, uh, to avoid and, and to um, not follow the operating procedure and, and bypass those rules. IBCs are fragile and have a number of vulnerabilities. For example, uh, heat that uh, can impact them to susceptible to piercing, bursting. I already, uh, I already mentioned these. IBCs are not designed for internal overpressure. Pressure, they can explode if uh, their contents expand, especially when they are mixed together uh, incorrectly or because there is a residue. Uh, in the IBC tanks, as we could see in uh, one of the examples. So that could be uh, an additional risk. So always, always check whether it's empty, whether it's full, whether, it's, uh, whether it contains any residue. I talked about aging, so it is an aspect here uh, that uh, should be checked periodically. And then most fires are sparked by hotspots incompatible mixtures or unstable substances inside IBCs. So make sure that you keep them away from sparks, that they are labeled correctly and that labels are, labels are visible. And also coming back to one of the examples, make sure that you pick the IBC that is labeled correctly and according and uh, for the needs of the use. And don't pick another one because it's like uh, with the like. And finally, as an operator, what can I do? A couple of examples that you may uh, want to think about, such as inspect IBCs before using and ensure that uh, the, uh, the, its uh, suitability and conditions, if any substance is already inside or uh, whether they are compatible with those to be added, leftovers, uh, Follow the rules and the procedures, uh, avoid any deviation from the company rules. If you see something that is uh, that doesn't look right, then you immediately tell the supervisor. But then, of course, you must have a supervisor who also uh, follows the operating procedures and the rules. And uh, uh, make sure that IBCs are placed outside on a flat surface to make them accessible for use, but mostly make sure that they are uh, kept inside rather than outside because of the, the weather conditions. And so this is what I, I had to say.
this is what I had to say about uh, IBCs in particular. And I'm aware that this is uh, quite a short intro to IBCs, but uh, what I what I was mostly mostly uh, amazed by the fact was that even in one cubic meter, there is a a very potential risk. And if you calculate that you keep hundreds of these IBCs in one place, then they can uh, really the risk can escalate very quickly. And especially what I I've come across from the hazardous waste industries and uh, those warehouses that may may not uh, notified as coma sites or Seveso sites and so on. And then they keep those IBCs without any labelings or the labelling is faded away or they just put everything or anything in the IBC. So that is uh, that is quite a, an unsafe practice. And uh, especially when it uh, comes to emergency response that I'm, I'm really, really sensitive about that because I saw that firefighters had such a, a dilemma and such a difficulty to decide what protections they should use. Should they use uh, protection against the toxic release and uh, and the gas vapors uh, coming from the as a result of the fire, or they should be protected first and foremost against the fire and the radi heat radiation. So it's really difficult, especially when they don't know what they are facing with to put out such fires. So that is that is also an aspect that I haven't highlighted in the safety lore, but uh, they are really important indeed. And if you want to learn more about uh, other areas, other subjects uh, that uh, are published by the iChemist Safety Center, please feel free to visit our website at uh, www.ichemy.org uh, safety center because you can be able you will be able to download all the guidance uh, documents for free such as the competency related or assurance engineering and design or the safety laws uh, you can find them you can use them in your trainings and uh, there are additional like education type uh, virtual HAZOP documents uh, the interactive case studies are subject to purchase or uh, are free for iChemist Safety Center member companies. So this was what I wanted to, to tell you. Sorry, tell you about uh, IBCs. And if you have any questions, I'm very happy to take uh, those questions on board. We have time, so please feel free to to add your questions. I hope that uh, I will be able to answer them. So what inspection apart from visual can be performed on IBCs? discoloration due to UV uh, chemical attack and scratches may not always be apparent. That is that is very, very uh, specific and a very, very valid and good question. I'm pretty sure that there are uh, different companies who actually uh, are focusing on those aspects and they are specialized to, to make those inspections. I am not really particularly familiar with these inspection methods. But that uh, question raised uh, a really valuable uh, conversation point. So I try to look up uh, later on. If you are still interested, I'm very happy to, to come back to you. Um, right now, I am not so sure that I have the answer in hand, but that's a really good question. So thank you for asking. Any other questions maybe? Or any comments, whether you have uh, seen these uh, in your operation, whether you have come across such problems, or it's not very particular in your industry. That's the interesting part with IBCs, that they can be part of any industries all over the globe with, with any. So, and especially the forklift incidents that you may have seen a lot of them, or the truck. Uh, okay. I don't see any more questions. And with that, I would like to thank you so much for your kind attention. And uh, the recording will be uploaded to the iChemy Safety Center website, as well as will be shared on different forums and, and platforms. So whenever you have time or, or you want your colleagues to watch it, please uh, feel free to share the link.
and thank you so much for, for coming today.